10th, but Pulse has climbed to 5th in the world rankings. The region's ambulance service has been accused of giving a second-class service to thousands of people in rural areas. Campaigners claim the East of England Ambulance Service is obsessed with chasing government targets. They say the needs of patients are being overlooked. They say resources are being concentrated in bigger towns and cities, and elsewhere lives are being put at risk. Our chief reporter Kim Riley reports on growing anger in Cambridgeshire. Ambulance Service, what's the location of the emergency? When a 999 call comes into the control room, the clock starts ticking and every second counts. There's a challenging government target to reach a patient on a life-threatening emergency call within eight minutes. When a car or ambulance arrives, the clock stops. Look East has seen figures showing huge variations in performance across the county of Cambridgeshire. In Cambridge, 86% are responded to within eight minutes. In Huntingdonshire, 66%. In East Cambridgeshire and Fenland, the figure falls to 62%. And in South Cambridgeshire, just 39% meet the target. In Littleport, the figure is 40%. The old East Anglian Ambulance Trust attached paramedics to some medical centres in a bid to strengthen coverage. Anger here that the scheme was killed off by the newly merged trust last year. I think what we had was brilliant. We should have kept it. There was no excuse to take it away and we need it back as soon as possible. We're not getting a service that's comparable to anywhere else in the country, and it needs to look at it urgently. 16-year-old Dan Jones shattered his leg playing football. When the ambulance arrived, the lone crew member wasn't qualified to administer morphine to stem the pain. After gas and air, he waited almost an hour and a half for a second ambulance to take him to hospital. I'm not happy because I was in you know, a lot of pain. They're there to stop pain and get you sorted out and fixed as quickly as they can. They took their time this time, didn't they? Not good enough, do you say? No, not good enough at all. I thought that he was treated very shabbily, lying on the floor with that type of injury. That type of injury is normally what you get from a car crash. And the response time is just not acceptable at all. Louise Brighton, who suffers from an irregular heartbeat, is campaigning to bring back the surgery-based paramedics. She's relied on them in the past. My heart rate can go up anything to 400 beats a minute or even more. I knew that as soon as I rang 999 up that they would be with me within minutes. We're not getting the service that we deserve. There is a lot of anger within the community. We have gathered a lot of support through our campaign. In country areas, ambulances with paramedics on board are often beaten to the scene of emergencies by first responders, community volunteers with basic life-saving skills. Critics accuse the trust of paying scant attention to what happens next. The clock uh, stops when the primary response arrives on scene. But we then have to look at the other response, which is actually the ambulance or the vehicle capable of transporting the patient. When does that arrive? And we have to make certain that the two elements of this um, picture do actually fall together and there isn't a hiatus between the arrival of the uh, initial response and then the arrival of the ambulance. The trust declined to be interviewed but says it's one of the best performing in the country. It says it's improved on the 9 to 5 GP surgery scheme with mobile paramedics providing 24-7 cover. But some of the trust's own paramedics have told Look East of their growing concerns at what they call a box ticking target culture that pays little attention to patients' real needs. Kim Riley, BBC Look East, Cambridgeshire. Now, this summer we're marking the 70th anniversary of the Battle of Britain. Winston Churchill famously said that never had so much been owed by so many to so few. Today, for the first time, archives showing the role RAF Duxford played in the battle are being put online. And not just online, but in what they call real time on Twitter. The details from Mike Liggins. It was the summer of 1940, and as those famous few fought the Battle of Britain, the operations record book at Duxford records who did what, where and when. Now all those details, all those neatly typed pages are going on the micro-blogging website Twitter on the exact date and time that they occurred 70 years ago. Um, if you're interested in what happened during the summer of 1940, if you're interested in people, if you're interested in people under an enormous amount of pressure who still managed to get the job done, um, then 
you know, this is, this, this is, this is going to be interesting for you. Some of the entries are mundane, many others are more poignant. This page details events on one of the busiest days of the battle. Some of the language used is very evocative. Listen to this entry from the 11th of August, 1940. Flight Sergeant Unwid was himself shot down, but made a wizard forced landing with undercarriage down. Fighter ace Douglas Bader will feature on the Twitter pages. A tremendous exhilaration, you know, a tremendous excitement. And then you sat out there in the sunshine, uh, eating or drinking tea or coffee or something, or playing the gramophone, the ones you used to wind up, you know, playing cards. So this is history in the digital age, the detailed and fascinating story of the men who fought the Battle of Britain. Mike Liggins, BBC Look East, Duxford. Now, you're going to want to know how to do that, aren't you? You can find out more by going to twitter.com slash RAFDuxford1940. That's twitter.com slash RAFDuxford1940. I shall be there. <laughs> well done, you. Well, we had a lovely weekend. Wasn't it just, yeah. Susie? Yes, yeah. an absolutely gorgeous weekend. It's not just the uh, people seeing the benefit of the sunshine, but we've got some weather pictures here as well, sent in by Jan Williams of Brightlingsea. Uh, this uh, blossom is showing nicely against the blue sky, and this magnolia really starting to uh, come out beautifully. So the garden moving on as well. Thankfully, a lot of us saw the sunshine today. Our satellite picture from this evening shows just how well broken the cloud has become today. There's a little bit of a cold front coming in from the north, but the weather through the weekend has been driven by high pressure, and for most of this week it'll be driven by high pressure as well, keeping things fine. For tonight, it's a case of clear skies to start off with. We will eventually pick up a little bit of patchy cloud coming in from the uh, North Sea, more especially over central and western parts, Northamptonshire, Cambridgeshire. But a fine dry night for all of us, and under those clear skies, temperatures falling away. I think down to lows, uh, around about uh, 3 or 4 degrees is the coldest we'll see tonight, and we'll keep a bit of a breeze coming in from the North Sea, so the nearer the coast you'll be, the more safe you are from ground frost. For inland areas, perhaps just a touch of ground frost as we head through towards the dawn period. But for tomorrow, a little bit of a change coming in the way. I mentioned this cold front earlier on. It's going to be moving down towards us as we head through the day itself. It's going to be introducing more in the way of cloud. But the morning starting off with almost unbroken sunshine. Really a lovely morning for getting out and about. Gradually, as we go through the day, we'll start to see this cloud moving in from the north, and I think it'll cover most of the region by the time we get through to tea time. You may be unlucky enough to see one or two uh, spots of rain coming out of this cloud. Most places, though, staying fine and dry right the way through. And despite the fact that it will turn more cloudy, temperatures shouldn't be a great deal different to those of today. Certainly where we see the best of the sunshine, 13, 14 degrees achievable once again. But like today, a bit of a breeze blowing in from the uh, North Sea, and that will be particularly noticeable around the coast, Norfolk and Suffolk, seeing a moderate, occasionally fresh breeze coming along. But the next few days will keep high pressure in charge. A bit of cloud around on Wednesday as the front gets away and then it'll brighten up. Thursday, patchy cloud and sunny spells. More of the same for Friday. So really the outlook for the rest of the week looking fine and dry. This wind blowing in from the northeast for the most part until we get through to Saturday. And then we start to see a westerly wind picking up. And that should also mean that the temperatures rise gradually as we go through the week, particularly for next weekend, 15 or 16 degrees coming back again. And it's a similar picture, really, for the overnight temperatures. Always the risk with these sort of situations of a touch of ground frost away from the coast. But gradually as we go through the week, I think the temperatures will recover. Overnight lows of 5 degrees as we go through Saturday night. There's your weather. Thanks, Phil. It is lovely to see the garden coming. The wind was so cold yesterday, wasn't it? It was, yes. <laughs> Good night. I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye.